Welcome to Contact Investigation 101. Our goal is to provide you with the basic tools you need to stop transmission of high impact infections in their tracks, make sure people already infected get proper treatment, and, where possible, prevent disease among people who have recently been exposed. If we don't pull that off, you can always ding us on the evaluation. This is Joyce with County Health Department Communicable Disease Line. Hey Joyce, this is Carl with Infection Prevention over at Pioneer Memorial. Just wanted to give you a heads up. We have a 20 year old male here came in through the ER and he's looking pretty sick. He's got a fever, headache, stiff neck, and gram negative diplococci on a spinal fluid smear. Thanks for letting me know. When did his symptoms start? Well, based on his chart, he first spiked a fever on Monday evening. I'll fax it over right away. Contact investigations typically start with identification of an index case. That is, infection with a virulent communicable disease in a person who might have had contact with other people while infectious. In addition to interviewing the ill person, a good way to assess the risk that an index case patient might have exposed other people is to review the medical record and case report for the person's illness. Learning when the case patient's symptoms started, what the signs and symptoms were, what laboratory findings showed, and when and whether the case patient started taking appropriate therapy can go a long way in helping to determine when the case patient might have been contagious. Confirming the diagnosis is also important. Measles and tuberculosis are spread by airborne transmission, involving fine aerosols that can hang in the air for long periods and drift greater distances from a contagious case patient. Meningococcus and pertussis are spread by heavier droplets that fall out of the air quickly and typically spread no farther than two meters when an infected person coughs or sneezes. Hepatitis A is primarily spread by the fecal oral route and hepatitis B can be spread via sexual transmission or exposure to the blood of an infected person. Contact investigation is the systematic collection of information to identify people who were exposed to an infected person during the time that person's illness was communicable and require some sort of public health intervention to detect, control, or prevent infection. The investigation also involves assessing the health status of these contacts and ensuring they have access to the necessary public health intervention. This might include medication to prevent or treat infection, immunization or immunoglobulin therapy, education about signs and symptoms to watch for, and interviewing these contacts to identify others they might have exposed. There are several core principles to bear in mind when beginning a contact investigation. First, depending on the illness involved, you might need to ask people about very sensitive subjects, including sexual behavior, identities of sexual partners, and use of illicit drugs. Your success will depend on an index case's willingness to trust you and to share information candidly. Taking a bit of time early in the interview to establish that trust and demonstrating your willingness to listen without judging the person providing you with this important information can help establish rapport and make your investigation a more effective one. In some cases, an index case might not be prepared to share key information during a first interview. In this case, there's nothing wrong with re-interviewing. If you think there is more you can learn, have a low threshold for getting back in touch. You might get much more complete and actionable information. Clearly, the information you collect is important in guiding your subsequent efforts to identify and interview contacts at risk for illness. This information is confidential and can only be shared with others in very limited situations. An important part of your job in contact investigation is to protect people's confidentiality. Letting them know that and that you take the responsibility seriously might increase their willingness to share sensitive information. Risk to public health staff engaged in contact investigations is typically minimal. Still, if you are interviewing an actively ill person who might be communicable, Make sure you take precautions to avoid exposing yourself to diseases spread by the respiratory route, such as meningococcus or tuberculosis. Also, in some investigations, you might be doing what in the old days was called running paper, identifying contacts in the field and making arrangements to meet them.
Keep in touch with others so they know where you are. Carry a cell phone so you can call 911 or other support rapidly if things get dicey. Finally, in the spirit of public health preparedness and prevention, stay safe by arranging any such meetings in public settings where others will be nearby, but not so close that they can overhear your conversation. A park bench or a quiet spot in a public building might be possible options. So Joyce, what do we have so far? So this is a 20-year-old male who first became ill with fever about three days ago. Um, he's presumptive for meningococcal disease mm -hmm. because he has a large number of gram-negative diplococci in his CSF. He came in through the ER and was hospitalized today around noon. Uh, Carl will send us the culture results as soon as he has them. But we gave the public health administrator and public information officer a heads up and checked in with emergency medical services. Um, no one there had an exposure during transport. Um, we also did get in touch with the community college since he does take classes there. Have you had a chance to talk to the patient? No, it sounds like he's pretty sick, but he is conscious and able to talk. So we'll go over to the hospital and find out who he's been around during his infectious period. What's the time frame for identifying contacts? We'll confirm the date of onset, then go seven days before they started contact precautions at the hospital. We'll also look from the investigative guidelines to see how they define contacts, and then go over to the hospital and interview the case. When doing a contact investigation for a potentially severe contagious illness, time is of the essence. Still, taking a few steps early on to clarify how contacts should be confined and reaching out to them should be prioritized can make your process much easier and make your interview with the index patient or the index patient's proxies much more efficient. It's worth thinking through who needs to know about the illness, both those within your agency and others who will be key partners in contact tracing. A good first step is to conduct a risk assessment for the index case. Look at the evidence for the diagnosis. Is it laboratory confirmed? Is the evidence otherwise compelling enough that you should start a contact investigation. Requesting and reviewing medical records and laboratory reports can help a lot in this assessment. Based on the pathogen, determine the modes of transmission to help decide who should be considered a contact. It's also important to determine the time when an index patient would have been infectious or the communicable period. This will also be a key piece of information in deciding who was actually exposed and will need to be interviewed. The next step is, if possible, to interview the patient. Depending on how virulent the pathogen is and how far the illness has progressed, some index patients might be unconscious or intubated. In that case, you might have to interview others who can help you piece together the index patient's activities and who might have had close contact. Timely interviews with such folks are usually a good practice anyway but, if at all possible, interview the index patient personally as early in the investigation as you can. Don't be shy about re-interviewing if new or confusing information comes to light. Mr. Fredericks, I'm Lauren Fisher with the County Health Department. I'm sure sorry you're having to go through all this. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been pretty rough, but uh, you, can, you can call me Kip. Every, everybody else does. Okay, well thanks, Kip. Sorry, I know you're not feeling great. But it's important to check in with you so we can help prevent other people from getting the same infection. Yeah. Okay, well, because the meningococcal infection you got can sometimes spread to other people, it's important to check in and go step by step um, to kind of see, you know, what activities and things you did um, during the week before you got sick. That helps to figure out who you might have had close contact with um, so we can let them know they might be at risk for infection and we can get them the antibiotics they need to help prevent them from getting sick. Wow, what days are we, what days are we talking about? So seven days before you got sick. When did you first start feeling ill with this? Um, uh, Monday. Um, Monday night and um, I started getting really hot and I felt these chills. And from your chart, it looks like you came to the ER at about noon today and they got you started on antibiotics. Yep, that sounds right. So let's start with a week, a week ago, Tuesday, June 28th. And when was the first thing you did that day? It's important early in the interview to explain in plain language why you're there. Someone who understands that you're interviewing them in order to help prevent spread of illness to other people is more likely to be open with you about what they did and who they spent time with. In the setting of acute illness, interviewing the patient also allows you to confirm key information, like the date and time of symptom onset, 
and when the person got started on antibiotics and entered isolation. Remember, one of the guiding principles of contact investigation is stay safe. If you're interviewing someone who is currently infectious, make sure to observe all isolation and infection control measures to keep from getting infected. So Kip, about Friday, July 1st, you mentioned a special training that day, right? Uh, yeah, I had a uh, meeting in uh, Boardman. Okay, um, and how long did that meeting go? Um, went from, uh, I got there around 8.30 and then uh, left in about 4.30. Um, and at that meeting, how they have things set up? Um, they had these big long tables that uh, all pointed towards the couple screens up in the front of the room. Okay, and were you sitting with the same people the whole time? Um, yeah, yeah, there were uh, two guys from the uh, forestry department. Okay, and do you remember their names? Uh, one of them was um, Steven, and then I don't think I got the name of the other guy. Okay, well, um, that's okay. Um, who put on the meeting? Um, that would be the Healthy Forestry Institute. Got it. And do you have a phone number for the person who set it up? I don't, but I can uh, get you the email of uh, this guy, Walt. Uh, I can send you those if that would be helpful. Yeah, no, that would be really great. Um, did you share drinks or food with anyone? No, I just bought myself a sandwich. Um, were you within six feet of anyone else for four hours or more during that meeting? I don't think so. Okay, um, and um, did you do anything else that day um, other than with your family, like a movie or dinner out or uh, anything? Nope, that was about it. Okay, um, and then Saturday you mentioned going out. Uh, yeah, so uh, most of the day I spent, I was uh, doing some yard work, but um, that evening I went out with some friends for a dinner and movie thing. Okay, and were those friends and people you've already, you've already talked about? I don't think so, no. Okay, um, and was the total time you spent with them more than four hours? Well, the movie was about two and a half hours, so yeah. That's so pretty sure, okay. Um, and who'd you go with? Um, a couple of women I've known since high school, and then uh, they brought a friend with them. And did you all sit together for both dinner and the movie? Uh, yeah. yeah. I better get in touch with these folks so we can help get them set up with preventative antibiotics. And what are their names and contact info? Um, that would be uh, Jessica Garcia and uh, Maria uh, Hendrickson. And um, Jessica's number is... Um, 616-7181 uh, and uh, she and Maria share an apartment and uh, they can get you in contact with Eric. During the interview, systematically gather and write down all activities the index patient engaged in during the communicable period. Then focus on each activity one by one and get the names, contact info, and nature of exposure for all contacts of the index patient. If the activity was a large social gathering where many might have been exposed, say in the setting of infectious tuberculosis or measles, get as much information as you can about when the index patient was there and any information about who organized the gathering or might be able to help determine who was there and when. Once you've gathered this information, the next step is to decide which contacts are your highest priority to reach. In some cases, you might have 10 or fewer contacts, and you can just get in touch with each of them as soon as they are identified. Sometimes the list of possible contacts can be much longer, and you'll need to prioritize. You might make this decision based on their apparent degree of risk for infection, taking into consideration how infectious the index case probably was at the time of exposure, how intense and prolonged the exposure was, and whether or not the contact is known to have been vaccinated or to be at high risk for severe illness based on age or underlying medical condition. For example, if you have a person with pertussis who works as a neonatal ICU nurse, the infants in the unit would be a priority group. Also, for some pathogens, there are immunizations or medications available that can help prevent or lessen the severity of disease in those exposed. If your outbreak involves one of these pathogens, consider whether the exposure was recent enough that these options would be indicated for a given contact. If so, you might want to move them up on the priority list. 
Hello. Is this Jessica Garcia? It is. Who's this? Joyce Woods from the County Health Department. I'm calling because you might have been exposed to someone with meningococcal meningitis. I heard that kid was in the hospital. Is he okay? Due to privacy laws, I can't give you that information. I'm calling you because you were identified as a contact of a case of meningococcal meningitis and I wanted to talk to you about your potential risks. People who've been in close contact with someone with meningococcal infection while that person is sick or in the week before illness are at more risk in getting the infection too. I just wanted to check in with you and let you know about ways to help prevent illnesses. I'm feeling okay, no problems. I'm sure glad to hear that. There is a medicine and antibiotic that you can take that is very effective in preventing illness in people who've been in contact with someone with this kind of infection. Okay. Since you had close contact with someone with meningococcal infection, the recommendation is to take a medicine called ciprofloxacin to help prevent yourself from getting sick too. Have you ever had an allergy to ciprofloxacin or any other antibiotic? No. Great. You just need to take one pill and we can arrange it with the pharmacy. That'd be great, thanks. Once you've developed your prioritized list, divide up the highest priority contacts among those available to take part in the contact investigation and interview these high priority people first. Arrange for any indicated preventive medications or immunizations and explain about the disease to which they've been exposed, what symptoms, if any, they should watch for, and what is recommended in the way of medical follow-up. Bear in mind, different people have different communication styles when it comes to telephone use. Some people will respond to a text or email, even if they won't answer their phone. If there are other contacts who are lower risk, but who still might meet criteria for preventive intervention, such as vaccine or antibiotics, contact them next. To keep a good record of contact tracing, document your communications with all contacts including arrangements made for prophylaxis. In this module, we've covered the fundamentals of contact investigation. To review, contact tracing is an important part of investigation for several communicable diseases, particularly those where exposure can put contacts at high risk of severe illness and for which there are interventions that can help prevent such illness. The goal of contact investigation is to prevent further spread of infection. There are three guiding principles of contact investigation. Listen, don't judge. Learn from, but protect the information people share. And stay safe.